Uh, good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome uh, here this morning to this uh, spotlight session um, delivered to you by CEIBS Global Executive MBA. Uh, my name is Marcel. Uh, I am a uh, marketing and admission manager for the Global EMBA program at CIBS. Very happy uh, to be here this morning to, to welcome you. And a big thank you to uh, AmCham Shanghai uh, for partnering with us on this. Always a, a pleasure to work with, uh, with, with AmCham. Um, I hope that our, our listeners, our audience are all well and, and safe and healthy um, as we all push through this, uh, this challenging time here, uh, uh, of course in China, but indeed around the world um, as well. And that is very much what we are uh, really talking about today as we have a fantastic uh, presentation coming up from our professor, Jeff Sampler, on developing strategic agility uh, for turbulent times. Um, Professor Sampler has two hats at CIBS. He is, of course, one of our, our wonderful faculty members, but he is also uh, our Acting Associate Dean for the Global EMBA program. And so I just want to take one slide here to uh, introduce to you a little bit um, about the Global EMBA program. So CEIBS, uh, for those of you who don't know us, we are um, the largest and most widely recognized business school in China. Um, I'm here in, in Shanghai, which is where our main campus is, out in, in Pudong and Jinchao. Um, but we actually have five locations worldwide. Uh, there are two more in, in China, one in Beijing and one in Shenzhen. And we have two uh, campuses uh, outside of uh, China, one in Zurich in Switzerland, and another campus in Accra in West Africa in Ghana, where we've been for, for more than 10 years, in fact. So the Global Executive MBA program um, is ranked fifth in the world. Um, so it's received very strong recognition. Um, that's the ranking from the Financial Times. So a very widely respected business school ranking. And that ranking actually puts us as the number one program in mainland China and the number one standalone program uh, in Asia. So there are many, many partnership programs, but we are, we are standalone. Um, it is uh, a, a real diverse student body of, of people who are in the mid to, to senior stage of, of their career, um, people who want to work towards an MBA without leaving the workforce. So last year, our, our most recent intake, we had uh, over 100 students and an average age of 40 um, with an average of 15 years of work experience. So quite senior uh, decision maker executives uh, within the cohort. Um, it's quite diverse. We uh, had 45% uh, international students in our most recent intake, and actually just under half of them are actually based outside of Shanghai, uh, flying in from different parts of China and indeed different parts of the world. Um, it is, of course, a part-time format. We uh, provide two options for our students. Once, uh, to, one option is to take classes once a month for four days at a time, or you can take classes for once every two months for eight days, we try and offer that flexibility so you can fit in um, with your, your busy schedule. Most of the modules take place in Shanghai, um, but we have global electives around the world uh, in locations such as New York, Sao Paulo, uh, India, Israel, uh, and several others. Our program is um, scheduled to begin uh, in late October this year, and uh, the final deadline to make an application uh, is August 23rd towards the end of August this year. So that is what the Global Executive MBA program uh, looks like. Um, our speaker today, as I mentioned, Professor Jeff Sampler is, uh, is also an acting associate dean, so he's in charge of this program. Um, today he'll be uh, delivering a, a wonderful lecture though. Professor Sampler um, has been with, uh, with SEEBS for coming up to eight years. Prior to SEEBS, he was uh, with uh, Oxford for many years and, uh, and London Business School. And he's been a collaborator with MIT for, for many, many years. Um, his research is, is really at a fascinating kind of area, and I think more and more relevant, particularly um, with, with what's happening in the world at the moment, um, looking at the strategic implications of new technology, the management of information as a strategic resource, and really looking at the intersection between strategy uh, and technology. And that's, I'm sure, something he will touch on in today's presentation. So uh, just before I introduce the, uh, the professor, um, a little bit of housekeeping. So professor was, um, is trying to keep this as close to a classroom e experience as possible. So even though we're online, so he will um, be very happy to take your questions. 
So please, if you use the chat function, um, you, you can uh, put forward your questions. Um, a professor will be very happy to answer them. He's gonna talk for around about an hour um, to, until 11 o'clock, um, and we'll have about 30 minutes there for, for questions. So please do feel free to put your questions forward to the professor. And as I say, we, we're going for a classroom environment here. He is going to put a few questions to you. So please, uh, when he puts his, uh, I think, pop quiz to you, uh, feel free to, to type your answers in um, into the chat function. Again, um, have a go at answering some of the questions uh, he put, puts forward. Um, so without further ado, I will ask uh, Professor, please, to, um, to join us then, Professor Jeffrey Sample. Great, good morning. Thank you, Professor. Perfect, can you hear me now? Very well, yes. Okay, great. Uh, good morning to everyone uh, in, in China. I'm in uh, sunny Bangkok at the moment and uh, you know, all, all is comparatively well here. Um, I, I, I mean, to say the world is challenging and any other metaphor I can think of is a total understatement in today's world. I mean, it's an unanticipated, by any scale, it's unanticipated in terms of the magnitude, the velocity of the changes that the world economy is going through. In the US, 22, people, 22 million people out of work in one month. Uh, oil prices, zero. I mean, who would have thought that a few months ago, six months ago, you know, fourth quarter, uh, you know, 2019, if you said, oh, I think the price of oil is gonna be zero in April, everybody would have, you know, taking you away to the padded room and giving you a nice comfortable jacket, you know, with your arms tightly fitting around your body, right? But that's the world in which we see ourselves, right? Unprecedented change. And, I, and, and the ripple effect of what we're going through now will, can, you know, after the current COVID pri uh, you know, crisis gets solved, the ripple of effect of what this means to society, to business, even to daily life is what we as business people and, and I guess po politicians, if you're in the, in the public sector, have to try to resolve. And I think that's the interesting question that, that you know, as, as thinking business practitioners, that's the question that you have to think about because therein lies the future opportunities for you. But before we go to the future, and every, it's, it's, it, everybody wants to say, well, what's gonna happen next year? What's gonna happen next year? Let's instead look at the past. So what I would like to do is, because I would argue that we don't even understand history. So, and, and if you don't understand history, I would argue, then you don't get to look forward, my friend. You're, you're not ready, right? So we have to make sure we even understand the world today and the world of the past before you start worrying about the future. And that's the mistake that most businesses make is they think, yeah, 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 I got it. I understand what I'm doing. I would argue you don't. So what I would like to do this morning is give you a pop quiz. Uh, and, and again, because my, a lot of my work deals with technology, I'm going to give you a pop quiz on technology. Now, I don't expect you, you know, you don't need a soldering iron and chips and, you know, a motherboard to, you know, to handle the quiz, but you just need a general business knowledge about what are the implications of technology. And so what I'm going to ask you to do is six question pop quiz. And you enter your answers uh, question by question into the chat function and Marcel and his team will see the answers and then they can sort of tell me what you're saying. Uh, and anybody who gets all six right, I, I didn't discuss this with Marcel, but I'm sure hopefully he will comply. Anybody gets all six right, they get a free Siebs uh, t-shirt that we will send to you. Yeah, so at least there's some incentive for your participation this morning. Does that make sense to everyone? So fingers on the keyboards, fingers ready, enter your answers into chat. Question number one. In 2004, what did the average computer game player look like in the USA? So if you can just tell me their age and how old they are and, and, and their uh, uh, gender, male or female. And if, if you want to... Uh, Think about uh, uh, some sort of demographics, you know, rich, poor, urban, rural, whatever, then, you know, you, you add that, right? I would tell you to draw a picture, but that's not going to work in the chat function. So average age of computer player in the USA, 2004. And I, I, I see a bunch of things popping up uh, here already. 
Uh, got it. Okay, has everybody had a chance to answer that? Okay, question number two. 2005, again in the USA. Tell me what is the age and gender of the average Wi-Fi user. So wireless access to the internet. What is the age and the gender of the average Wi-Fi user in the USA in 2005? Okay, now two things I, I have to question from, from as I see your answers pop up. Number one, when somebody says both genders, I don't know what that means. I mean, I, I, I live in Thailand, so you know, I'm familiar with the concept of lady boys and this kind of stuff, but you know, if, if you're saying this, the split is exactly 50-50 between male and female, maybe that's what you mean. I, but I don't know what both genders means. But there's a more fundamental problem, which is uh, you don't understand math. Uh, an average is a single number. If you enter a range like 2 to 80, right, you don't get money for writing down 2 to 80, right? You don't, you don't win a prize, right? So you have to pick a, an average is a single number. So if you've entered a range, pick, pick one of those many numbers, yeah? That's an average. Now, I'll, I'll give you the answers to the pop quiz at, at the end. Uh, now, for questions three and four, clearly some of you like ranges, so let's use a range um, for three and four. Question number three. In the UK in 2014, what is the age of the average internet user within a range of 10 years? So the age of the most people using the internet in the UK within a range of 10 years. So I don't know, 10 to 20, 15 to 25, 20 to 30, whatever, whatever you think is appropriate. So the age of the most people using the internet in the UK in 2014. Well, incredibly consistent views. I don't know if you're right. Now, somebody put 14 to 55. I would like to just submit that's not 10 years. But I appreciate, you know, you're, you're, maybe that was just a, 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 a missed typo there. Uh, question number four, in 2017, what percentage of international phone calls for the entire world were made using Skype? So within a range of 5%, yeah? So percentage of international phone calls for the entire world, what percent were made using Skype within a range of 5%. Wow, we, we, we really don't know. I, I have answers from 1% to 80%. So this one we, we have no idea, we're all over the map on. Okay, question number five. Uh, 2014, tell me, the number two search engine in the world. And by number two, I mean the second most frequently visited search engine in the world. So based on daily traffic, yeah? So the second most frequently visited search engine in the world in 2014. It's clear we're in China. I see a lot of Baidu's popping up. Okay, let's look at uh, the next question, number six. March 2012, tell me the number one brand of digital camera in the world. And by number one brand, I mean the, the brand with the largest market share. So what brand of digital camera has the largest market share in the world in March 2012? Okay, um, I, I would like to, 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 to say, Marcel, I think we're okay. Nobody has, has, has uh, won a t-shirt here. Nobody got them all right. I'm not sure if we got any right. Uh, 
Uh, when I just, for question number six, I saw somebody wrote Kodak as the answer. I would like to say that is the right answer, but for the wrong century. Yeah, so if we were looking at, you know, 1912, not 2012, Kodak definitely would be the right answer, but 2012, no. Um, so since we've gotten basically nothing right, this is not, I mean, you, you should be depressed, right? The world is depressing enough already. I don't want you to feel bad about yourself. So let me try to cheer you back up, right? And so you can feel good about yourself. So what I want to do is I'm going to add a seventh question to the pop quiz. Now, this is not for money, but this is just to make you feel good, right? So I'm, I'm going to give you a, a, something very simple, right? Something very, very easy so that at least you get one right to this morning. So question number seven is the same question as number six, but one month later. April 2012, tell me the brand of digital camera with the largest market share in the world. And I will tell you the answer in six and seven are different. You may choose to write the same thing both times. That's merely a test taking strategy, but I will tell you the answer is different. Okay, maybe question seven is not as easy as I thought. Now, let's go, now, why did I give you this pop quiz? <clears throat> it's not to see how much you understand about technology. But what, I use the pop quiz because the answers and the questions will start to show you some principles of strategy in a world that's increasingly unpredictable, right? Because that's the world in which we live. The pace of change is faster and the range of outcomes is more divergent. And so therefore, many traditional tools and techniques of strategy, I would argue, are not relevant in this kind of environment. Yeah, and so I can tell you that academically and show you a lot of research, but instead I use the pop quiz to start to show you principles of strategy that I think are appropriate in this world of rapid, increasingly unpredictable change. So that's why I give you the pop quiz. So now let's go back and look at question number one. Uh, average computer game player in the world, uh, sorry, in the USA in 2004, the answer is 26 year old male. And more interestingly, uh, the the, if you look at the social characteristics, uh, AB demographics, so middle, upper middle income and uh, university graduate, right? Now, the, now I realized 2004 was a long time ago. But the reason I picked 2004 is it's a tipping point. It's uh, the first, in 2004, for the first time, computer game sales surpassed that of movie ticket sales in the USA. So computer games are the number one form of entertainment in the USA based on money spent. And in the last 15 years, that gap has just exploded, right? And, and now computer game sales are bigger than the movie industry. They're bigger than uh, the movie industry, American football, American basketball, baseball, and NASCAR combined, right? So it's the computer games have just absolutely exploded, right? Now, but in, in our mind, we always think the average computer game player is some teenage boy, right? No, it's not that at all. Now, I realize 2004 was a long time ago. So let's ask a, more, a question that should be much more recent and easier for you. Uh, last year, tell me what did the average computer game player look like in the world? So if you just type in, again, some answers on chat. What did, what did the average computer game player in the world look like last year? 30, 40, 22, 14, 15, 17? Interesting. Some of you are just sort of taking uh, 15 and adding, you know, uh, 16 years to it. The answer is 42-year-old female. For the first time in history, the majority of computer game players, 53%, are now women. Why? I mean, it's very simple. 
if you think about it, I mean, for the, for the women that are listening, you, you know this already, women are much smarter than men. But more specifically, cognitively, uh, women are much better at parallel processing than men, right? And what's happened in the last few years is this is now the game console. It's not a computer. It's not a set-top box, right? It's this is the game console. As the device changes, the demographics of the user changes. And it's the Candy Crush phenomenon, right? I have two minutes, right? I'll, I'll play a game, right? And when I go to dinner in China, when I'm on the, the metro in Shanghai or Beijing, I'm fascinated. No one talks. They're all doing this, right? Even when you have four people sitting at the same table, they're not talking to each other. They typically are just all using their phones, right? So as the device changes, the demographics of the user changes. So for those of you that are in the gaming industry, please realize based on numbers, your primary customer is a 42 year old female. I think we need, there's a huge entrepreneurial opportunity there in terms of content development that is suitable and interesting for that demographic. Question number two. Uh, what does the average Wi-Fi user look like in the USA in 2005? Now, most people said in their 20s or 30s. And if you think about what industry, because we have a sort of a classic image of these people, you think, well, it's an IT person, a salesperson, consultant, you know, a, a road warrior, right? Somebody who's either very technically savvy or constantly traveling and needs connection. The answer is 15-year-old boy. Why? because corporations were very slow to adopt Wi-Fi because of security concerns, hacking. Now, I don't know how it works in your house, but I can tell you in the USA and Europe at that time, what happened is, you know, teenage boys have their a slumber party, they have their friends over, a sleepover, they bring their computers, they wanna play games in every room of the house. The kids drove the parents crazy. You pay for the software, I will install it, I'll make sure it works. Now, what are the best, what do the, the questions one and two tell us about strategy? It's very simple. The best minds in the world get it wrong. It's very hard to predict the future in a world of change. We get it wrong. So what does that tell us about strategy? Let's say it in, in, in more traditional strategy language. Strategic change is just as important as strategy formulation. Because your first strategy will probably be wrong. Now, how good are most companies at strategic change? The simple answer is not very good. Most, and, and this is a huge problem in Asia. Why? Because the CEO's ego identity is tied up in the strategy. If I change the strategy, I look weak. They lose face. Therefore, they resist. If you're going to be innovative strategically, the first thing you must do is understand that change is not a sign of weakness. We all change. The question is when you change. If you're the first one to see the world is different, fantastic. That's how you make money. If you're the last one to change, then you should be embarrassed. But change itself is not a sign of weakness. It's when you change. Strategic change is just as important as strategy formulation. That's lesson number one. Question number three. Um, this was the age of the most people using the internet in the UK. And now if I look at the answers, if I remember them, most of you put something between 10 and 30, sort of, you know, prime time, uh, you know, education, university years, or then into the workforce. The answer, somewhat surprisingly, is 65 to 75. 65 to 75 years of age. Why? Now, it, it's not because the, you know, daytime TV is bad in the UK and, you know, senior citizens have nothing to do. It's very simple. It's a simple numbers game. There are more old people than young in the UK. Europe is an aging continent, right? It's just a numbers game. 
right? Uh, now, I don't know who was advising David Cameron on Brexit, right? But clearly they did not think about demographics, right? There are more old people than young in the UK. Older people vote in higher percentages than young people. A majority of older people wanted to leave the EU, not stay. The outcome of the Brexit vote was not a surprise if you thought about demographics. So what's my message? Understand demographics before you do strategy. Because demographics are a comparative anchor of stability in a world of change. They don't change as quickly as other things. And the mistake we always make is we generalize to the world based on ourselves. Now, let me tell you, my friends, you are not normal. Now, when I say normal, I mean statistically normal. You're not average. You make too much money. You're too well educated, right? You are not average, right? Uh, look, look in, in, in uh, you know, if, if some of you are involved in, in government or you have great access to government in, in China, please do something for me. Historically, China and Japan have not been good friends. They don't get along. Now, my advice to China today, just leave Japan alone. Just leave them alone. Why? Because they're destroying themselves. They need no help. Why? Demographics. There are more old people than young in Japan. Now, what does that mean economically? More people taking money out of the economy than people putting money into the economy. Japan has the highest debt per capita per person of any nation in the world. And I've been told, if you look at all the different government policies, et cetera, in Japan, that the Japanese government is supporting over 80% of the shares of stock uh, traded on the Nikkei Stock Exchange. So the Nikkei Stock Exchange is not an exchange to reflect the value of companies. It's a complex government bailout support system, right? It's, it's, it's not a market as, as we would think about it in traditional terms. You can't escape demographics. Now, I can give you number after number of percentage population decline in Japan, et cetera. You're going to forget them all. Let me summarize it very simply. The extent of the problem, the severity of the problem. Last year in Japan, there were more adult diapers sold than baby diapers. How do you recover from that? You can't start having babies when you're 70. Biology does not work that way. And historically, Japan is a closed society. They don't allow immigration. So most countries solve this problem through immigration. That's not going to happen in Japan, unless there's gonna be you know, radical changes, right? So, so social changes, et cetera. Yeah, so, so Japan, I don't you know, with all due respect to Abenomics, et cetera, I don't know how that that's going to happen, right? I don't, I, I don't see how this is gonna change. Now, China is going through a similar phenomenon, right? The number of people will double over 60 in the, in the next 10 years in China. But now let's, now let's make another, uh, this is a forecast that I increasingly hear in China. <coughs> uh, population in China today is about 1.4 billion. 50 years from now, 2070, what will the population of China be? Just type in some guesses in the chat function. What do you think the population of China will be in 2070? 50 years from now, 1 billion, 1.1, 15, I assume that's 1.5 billion, 1.2 billion, 2.8, wow, 2.8. Okay, so around a billion plus minus, a billion to a billion five seems to be where most of the answers are. The answer I increasingly hear when I talk to uh, very large real estate developers, et cetera, 700 million, half. Why? the byproduct of the one child policy, right? I mean, uh, you know, I know we don't have the one child policy anymore in China, I fully understand that. But the simple reality is uh, the number of child, children being born in China has not increased dramatically even despite the removal of the one child policy. Why? Because there are largely two factors that influence childbirth within a country. One, 
is uh, income levels. As income goes up, the number of children born declines. Second is women's education. As women's education levels increase, the number of children born declines. I mean, very simply, the, the woman has more career choices than simply managing the home. And what's happened in China during the last 40 years, when the one child, when, or during the, the one child policy, both of those factors have gone up dramatically, women's education levels and income levels. So even we remove the, the policy, then these other factors mitigate childbirth. So China is going, you know, every country is going to go through similar problems, right? India. Uh, now, I, I think I saw at least one or two Indian uh, looking names pop up in chat. So I assume we have some Indian experts in, uh, on, on the call here, on the, on the session. So what's the birth rate in India today? What's the birth rate in India last year? Any guesses? What's the birth rate in India? 1.7%. 1.9%, okay, I, high, one, 2.5, 1, 2, 1, 3. Now, everybody gives me percentages, and, I, and, and I, I never know how to interpret those numbers because often when you see percentages, it's either percentages of the population or it's percentages of, you know, children of married couples, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's always confusing, but I'll give you the, the birth rate in India in a, in a different way, hopefully a way that you'll always remember it. The birth rate in India is one child per second. There's one, there's another, there's another, right? One, now to put that number in perspective, the birth rate for the world is 2.4 children per second. So that means just over 40% of all births in the world occur in a single country. If you know that number, what can you predict is the demand for real estate, education, healthcare, retail, right? I mean, understand demographics before you do strategy. A comparative anchor of stability. That's principle number two. Now, let's look at the next question. Um, in 2017, what percentage of international phone calls for the entire world were made using Skype? Now, this is one we had no idea. The answers were from 1% to 80%. The answer, <coughs> 44%. of all international phone calls in 2014 were made using Skype. Now, what's my point? If you, if, I mean, historically, if you go back in time uh, 20 years ago, long distance revenue was thought just to be growing forever, right? But why? Because we're becoming a more global society. Business is more global. Families are more global. Everybody's making more phone calls. But what happened? In a period of five, six years, the telecom industry saw 80% of their long distance revenue disappear. Now, if you look at, if you look at, you know, through voice over IP, Skype, and then in today's world with, with WeChat, WhatsApp, Line, et cetera, it's about 80%, right? About 80% of all. Now, somebody said this doesn't account for in, intra-branch, but this is international, right? So all I wanna point out, the, the third principle, in a world of change and innovation, Cash cows do not live very long. You think you're going to make money from the same set of products for the next 10 or 20 years? Good luck. You better wake up. Most companies have five to 10 years before the, the revenue declines dramatically because the, the world is constantly changing. If I were making huge strategic investments today, capital expenditures, where the major revenue was seven, eight, ten years out, wow, I would really think carefully before making those investments because I'm not sure I can predict demand. I'm not sure I can predict prices. Look at the oil industry, right? I mean, you're, you have to make all these huge investments up front, right? It's absolutely a nightmare, right? And I just saw somebody put up uh, why Voso or IP is banned in the UAE absolutely right. I mean, the government owns the telecom system, 
they would like to continue to make money. And so uh, if you ever try to make even a Skype call into the, UK, into the UAE, it's like 20 cents a minute. It, it's absolutely crazy. But increasingly what's happening, you have Toe Talk and other things in the UAE. People are now starting to rebel, saying, look, we can't do business without WhatsApp, et cetera. And so there's this ongoing clash between government who wants to either control or create revenue versus people that want to communicate and get business and, and other things done, right? So it's, you know, and, and again, this one, I'm always going to say technology is going to win. They're always going to find a way around government regulation because there's always going to be new apps popping up faster than governments can regulate them. That's the simple reality, right? But cash cows do not live very long in a world of change and innovation. So be careful. Be careful. Yeah? Now, uh, <coughs> question number five. 2014, what's this, the number two search in, in the world? Second most frequently visited. Now, by far the most popular choice from the chat messages was Baidu. Um, somebody said Google. I appreciate the intuitive, you know, you know believing China is dominant, but, you know, Google is definitely number one. But it's not Baidu, it's not WhatsApp, it's not, uh, it's not Yahoo, it's not uh, Bing, YouTube. YouTube is the answer. Now, I, I know in the formal sense, YouTube is not a, a, a search engine, right? It, it only searches itself, it doesn't search everything. But I'm making a fundamental point is that the future is video, right? The future is video. That's how most people want to communicate today. Uh, Alibaba produced some research a couple of years ago that must have killed them to admit. They said within five years in China, one third of business supplier decisions will be made over WeChat conversations. Now that's B2B, not B2C, right? That's B2B. So increasingly video is going to be the dominant way that people will choose to converse. And in today's COVID social distancing world, we see it even more. Yeah, this, these numbers are just spiking like crazy, right? So it's, this is definitely going to be part of the new normal, I think, for some period of time because the trend was already there. This has merely accelerated a trend that was already in place. Now, in China, in Asia, the other really critical trend is the future is mobile. China is a world leader in mobile innovation. It's not Europe, it's not the US, it is China. After China, I would say places like India, maybe af parts of Africa, et cetera, with M-Pesa, these kind of things, but Europe and the US are really far behind in terms of mobile. Um, two years ago, I was doing an executive education program with senior executives from PayPal at C's campus in Shanghai. So these guys, the top team flies over from Shanghai to China, from, from California to Shanghai for two weeks. And they say, okay, we want to understand China. Classic American company wants to understand China in two weeks. Maybe slightly more complicated than that, but, you know, I appreciate the effort. So I'm talking to them on day one of the program, sort of, you know, as I'm talking to you, asking them, you know, a lot of questions about their business. And I said, look, who's the, who's the biggest, you know, uh, online payment system in the world? And they said, we are. And I said, really? And they said, yeah, 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 we're the biggest. And I said, wow, I, I, I apologize. I must have very different numbers than you. So could you tell me your, your numbers? And they said, our daily transaction volume is 17, 18 million a day. And I said, oh, that's the same number I have. And they said, you know, that's, we're, you know, we're 1718. Uh, MasterCard Visa is about 8 million. American Express is 4.5 million. We're the biggest. And I was like, okay, those are the same numbers I have. But, you know, have you heard of Alipay? 175 million transactions a day. WeChat, 660 million transactions per day. Now, these are early 2019 numbers, so definitely now the numbers are much higher. As I told them these numbers, you could just see the expression on their face of, oh my God, what are we doing? We're, we're round off error. We're irrelevant in this game. Opportunity is gone. The more interesting number is how much money 
is transferred over WeChat in China per day, on an average day. And these numbers are from 2009, early 2019. $23 billion a day are transferred over WeChat every day in China. And again, the, the COVID-19 has only caused those numbers to explode. I haven't been able to get my hands on more recent numbers, but I think, you know, coming out in April, May, we'll start to see what the numbers have been like in the last quarter in China, but I'm just predicting, you know, huge, huge growth. So if you're going to do business in Asia, if you're going to do business in China, if you're going to do business in a COVID-19 post world, the future is video. The future is mobile. How are you going to contact your customers? This is a question that every business has to fundamentally rethink. And we already see it playing out. Netflix, the market cap of Netflix last week was higher than Disney. Why? Because Netflix has a platform that reaches the customer in this world. Disney does not. Their, their amusement parks are closed in most parts of the world. Movies releases are delayed because cinemas are closed. They're in a world of chaos. The market cap of Netflix is greater than that of Disney. Now, is that sustainable? I doubt it. But the mere fact that it happened at all, incredible. Absolutely incredible. So the principles, the future is video. And if you're in Asia, the future is mobile. Question number six. Um, the brand of digital camera with the largest market share in the world in um, March 2012. Now, Canon seem to be the most popular answer. Now, if, you're, if you have a Canon or Nikon or something like that, why do people buy those? What, what does Canon assume the customer values when they buy one of their products? If you think about it, you could say convenience, et cetera, whatever, but, but most people, it's all push one button these, these days. It's a very simple product. What do people really want? Or what does Canon think they want? Quality. Professional, right? The pictures look great. And so therefore, what does Canon do? They hire engineers that are great at, at optics, at, at all the engineering to, to increase the color, the, the number of pixels, and you know, the lighting and all this kind of stuff. But what does the average customer really want? What does the average customer really value? The ability to share pictures real time. That's what the average customer wants. Facebook has over a hundred billion, uh, sorry, has, has uh, over a billion users, over a hundred billion photographs stored on Facebook. So it averages out over a hundred pictures per user. I, I have never been able to get WeChat to tell me how many pictures are stored on WeChat in China. It has to be more than a hundred per user because people love photographs in Asia. So it has to be way, way higher than that number. So the question that we have to think about strategically is two things. Number one, how do I define industries? So in other words, if, 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 if this is 2012, right? And let's just say Canon has a five-year planning horizon. So that takes us back to 2007. So I go into... Canon strategic planning room in 2007 with an iPhone and I say, oh, baby, this is your death. This is, this is the future of digital photography. What do they say? They say, you're crazy. That's not a camera. It's a piece of junk, right? It doesn't, it doesn't do anything, right? It takes bad pictures. It's, it's horrible. So where do I put digital cameras? If I'm doing a classic Porter's Five Forces, is it in the industry? Is it a substitute product? Is it a new entrant? Depending on where you put the camera, digital camera, it, it, in terms of the, the, the digital phone, it totally redefines the industry in terms of distribution of profit, right? If you put it in the industry, 
outside, substitute new entrant, the power, the profitability of the entire industry changes. Second critical point, core competencies. The skills of today are probably not the skills required tomorrow. Right, so today, in at least a few years ago, the, the photography industry was all about professional quality, et cetera. But the real valuable skill was the ability to share photographic images real time. And if you look at the current generations of Nikon and Canon cameras, what do they have? Built-in Wi-Fi, right? So even they realize that even with great pictures, the value is in sharing them real time. Now, it's not as good as a cell network, but they're clearly moving that way, right? So the skills of today are not the skills of tomorrow. And we see this happening in industry after industry. Intel, clearly the number one PC company in or a chip company for PCs and for, the, for many years. But if I look at Intel's market share in smartphones and tablets, what is it? Less than 1%. Less than 1%. Who's number one? Qualcomm. Number two, ARM. What's their strategy? Battery life. Speed is good enough. The critical thing is battery life. Intel is all about making chips faster, 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 right? Every time there's a new generation of Intel chips come out, they brag about their chip is faster, faster, faster. Now, fast is great, you know, but let me tell you something very simple. You don't buy a Ferrari for good gas mileage. Intel chips are very fast, but they use a lot of battery to achieve that speed. Qualcomm and ARM say, eh, speed is good enough. Anytime I have a choice between more speed or more battery life, I take more battery life. Intel takes more speed. And they have engineers that know how to do that speed, not battery life. So Intel, when the whole chip industry is consolidating, Broadcom wants to buy Qualcomm, SoftBank buys ARM. Nobody's talking to Intel. Why? Because their market share, the grow, potential growth is not looking good. Because they're number one, but they're number one in a market that's declining. And the market that's exploding in growth, they basically don't exist. So if you can tell me you're number one in your markets, I'm gonna ask you a very simple question. Are you number one in the right markets? Are you number one in the market that's growing? Or are you number one in the market that's declining? So the principles of strategy from, the, from these questions are two. How do I define industries? More specifically, how do you define today's competitors and tomorrow's competitors? The problem for most successful companies is they define the industry too narrowly. Existing competitors. So Canon says, oh, I compete against Nikon and Olympus. That's it. They don't think that they're competing against Apple or Huawei or any of these kind of companies, right? So you have to define the industry more broadly. And the skills of today are probably not the valuable skills of tomorrow. Now, the answers to my pop quiz for questions six and seven. Question number six, Nokia. Question number seven, Samsung. March the 31st, 2012. Samsung surpassed Nokia in global market share for the first time in history. And if you think about what's happened in Nokia in you know, eight years, they went from number one in the industry to basically non-existent. It can happen to all of us. So those are, these are the principles of strategy that I think we have to start to incorporate into our business acumen if we're going to succeed in a world of change and a world of increasing unpredictability and rapid change, not just change, but rapid change. Let me wrap up and then I'll turn it over to you guys for Q and A. Uh, my last book was called Bringing Strategy Back, Making Strategy Relevant in, in This World of Change, et cetera. And the metaphor, the subtitle of the book was Developing Strategic Shock Absorbers. In other words, how do I, develop these uh, mechanisms to isolate unanticipated events, right? Because one unanticipated bump cannot destabilize my entire company or destroy it, right? And so <clears throat> the metaphor I'd like to use today is, is safe. How do you keep your company safe from a strategic planning point? S-A-F-E. 
F E. S. Speed. You're going to have to plan much more quickly, much more frequently, right? Uh, Mahindra, very successful automobile company in India, a few years ago when I wrote a case on them, at that point in time, the Indian economy was growing about 10, the GDP growth rate was about 10% of the year. Mahindra does monthly strategic planning. Monthly strategic planning. Now that sounds crazy, right? But, but in, in a world where, where GDP is 10% a year, that's about the same as the annual planning cycle in Europe. So I know China had negative growth this last quarter, but historically the growth in China has been six, 7%, while in the West it's been one, two. So a five-year planning horizon in Europe is the same as 30 years in China, right? Five-year planning horizons do not make sense in China, and I would argue anywhere in the world today. So speed is absolutely critical for successful strategic planning in today's world. A, agility, the ability to change quickly. That's absolutely what you need, right? And I think one of the critical things that help us change quickly is the decision trigger. Very clear decision triggers. As soon as something changes, boom, I know I have to change. You don't debate it, you don't create a task force, you know. Right. So Air Deccan was one of India's uh, their first low cost airline, like an Air Asia or an EasyJet or something like that. And they were started with very modest funds, a $10 million investment. Uh, within two years, they became the biggest domestic air carrier in India. How did they do it? Very smart decision trigger. Number one, they reconceptualized the industry. They said, if we're a low cost airline, in India, how, who's our real competitor? It's not other airlines. In India, there's about 9 billion passengers a year that travel via Indian rail. 1% uh, travel first class that yields 42% of the revenue. So what they, they said, our real competition is the train. And so then they looked at any train route that had a high percentage of first class train travelers that was not well served by air. And then they said, for this, we have to have a, a, a cost model such that a first class train ticket and, a, and an air ticket cost the same or even the air tickets a little less. And then the business proposition was very simple because there are no high speed trains in India, right? So for one hour on the plane, you would have to travel 12 to 18 hours on the train for the same money. And they became the biggest domestic air carrier in two years. So agility have decision triggers that help you understand when you need to move. F, focus, focus. You, the world is changing so quickly. You can't in, uh, understand everything. You can't take in everything. Focus on those few factors that you think have a big influence on your business, your customer, whatever. You must understand it's about focus. You, if, if today, if you look at, if you try to consume all the information on the COVID-19, you will be ground to a halt. Focus, right? And I can give you uh, tons of techniques on how to do that. It's hard to do in the amount of time we have, but, but there's a lot of things you can do to help focus on that. Last, E, education you must continue to learn about your own business, about your customers, about changing technology that's going to let you do things in a different way than you've ever thought possible before, more cost effectively, or even new products that were never possible before, such as Netflix, you know, streaming, all this kind of stuff, not even possible a few years ago, but now that's increasing the way most people are consuming entertainment, right? Zoom right, which we're using now, right? I mean, the founders made another few billion, I think $5 billion increase in his wealth. Amazon in the US, the, I think they're releasing their numbers uh, this week uh, for the last quarter, but it looks like sales of Amazon will be $10,000 a second, 24 hours a day, $10,000 a second, right? We must continue to educate ourselves about what is technically possible.
about what our customer desires and about how we can provide it. It's going to be different skills, different processes, and maybe different people. That's how you keep your business safe in a world of rapid, increasingly unpredictable change. Thank you very much. Now, let me open it up for, I'll turn it back to Marcel. I don't know if they want to coordinate the Q&A or how you want to prioritize. I see things popping up, but uh, yeah, I'll thank let you. Marcel thank you very much, Professor. Prioritize and then you, you filter and decide which questions I answer. Yeah, so we, we do have a few coming through. I'll try and filter them as best I can. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll try and get through as many as we can. Um, sure. Encourage uh, as many of you to to type your questions in the chat. We already have a few coming through, so I'll just try and um, start. There was one uh, some time ago, um, which is you mentioned um, about mobile of innovation in China compared to the US. You know why is is Western uh, mobile innovation behind China? I mean, there's two, two a couple of reasons. One is the infrastructure in the US is far behind that in China. Right. So so there's just a technical infrastructure uh, regulation has has also impeded innovation in the U.S. And I think the, the, the third factor is leapfrogging. Right. The U.S. was a PC centric country. So everybody had PCs in China. Very few people had PCs. And so when mobile uh, phones you know, became so prevalent, people just leapfrog and then that became the dominant platform for doing everything. While in the US, you tended to have, you know, a phone and a PC and the phone was for casual things and you did everything else on your PC. No, in, in China, in Asia, it's all in on the phone, right? And I see people sending major documents, you know, huge PDF files over, you know, WeChat and all this kind of stuff. And in, in the US, seldom would even people think about that kind of stuff. So a combination of infrastructure, government policy, and just technological leapfrogging. Great, thank you. Um, another, I'm gonna try and kind of merge a couple of questions here. So um, a question from um, someone which is, how do you apply your insights and in rapid change to personal career trajectories? And the follow-up question is, which industries will do best in the coming five years, but perhaps in, uh, following on your own uh, idea that five years is too much, perhaps you might also just look at which industries are going to come out strongest from this pandemic and, uh, and which are going to be affected uh, very badly. Right. I mean, the, the bad ones are obvious, right? I mean, we see that already. I mean, airlines are just going to take a huge hit. Uh, I, I, I don't think you're going to see many A380s, you know, flying around anymore. You know, I mean, I love Emirates Airlines, but God, they have to be crying about, you know, because they're really, I mean, they've already, Airbus has already said we're stopping to make A380s. Emirates is the major, you know, user of those, but I just don't see them flying A3. I don't see A380s being economically viable. So anything in terms of tourism, uh, hotel, airlines, you know, sports, venues, music, any, you know, thing where you have a lot of people in one place place I, I just i think even after it's safe i think people will it's almost like traveling post 9 11 right you knew it was safe but nobody wanted you know you thought twice about it i i was on a, a plane in early march we went to myanmar uh just for a three-day weekend my wife and i and and at that time you know everything was still moving they had no you know COVID 19 at, at all recorded in myanmar at that time but when we were flying back uh, from from uh, Yangon to to Bangkok, there was a group of Italian tourists in the in the airport right at, at the gate. And as soon as everybody heard these people talking Italian, you could just feel the tension of everybody. Like, oh my God, you know, because this is when Italy was going through all the all the you know lockdowns and all this kind of stuff. So I think those are the obvious ones, right? Um, the the winners. Um, you know, I've been, I, I do a lot of work in India and, I, and I've been talking with a company that I know very well. And I think, you know, uh, the whole BPO offshoring of software development is just going to grow like crazy. Uh, I saw this happen in the, the last recession, 2007, eight. I see it happening even more now. Why? Because everybody has to cut expenses, right? Everybody's looking to ways to save money. And, and number two, nobody, because you can't predict the future, as much, nobody wants to take on full-time staff, right? You want variable costs, not fixed costs. So offshoring, 
is doing very well in terms of software development. I think online education is going to do very well. So, uh, you know, I was talking to a company called Oddvisor in the U in Silicon Valley. They've signed up 135 content experts, Tom Peters, Guy Kawasaki, Seth Godin, all these kind of guys. And what they're doing, rather than doing podcasts for like an hour or something like that, they're sort of doing these micro podcasts, five minutes, right? Of here's a critical business idea and here's the action you should do, right? So very much geared toward the business person with here's the big idea, here's the immediate thing you need to think about, right? So, and, and they've again seen their sales grow you know, in terms of subscription, Netflix, you know, any, anything that allows you to consume information like that. I think those things are going to grow dramatically. You know, all the online retail stuff we see with Alibaba, you know, Jing Dong, Amazon, those are obvious things, right? But I think what will be more interesting is, you know, the social implications of how people choose to interact in the future, right? And increasingly, I think, again, China was already there. If I look at WeChat, you know, and, and the influencers and things like that, you know, the power of those people, you know, the, the, in, in China is, is just absolutely unbelievable. I, I mean, I, I apologize. I don't remember her name. I, I don't in Chinese, but everybody just calls her the queen of Taobao, right? I mean, you know, she's an absolute, you know, KOL, right? She's this key opinion leader. And I, I, I was, you know, told, I mean, you guys probably know better than I do, but I was told, you know, her revenue is a million dollars a day, you know, just doing these kind of things. And I'm like, oh my God, you know, I mean, we've always had celebrity endorsers, et cetera, but you see average people becoming KOLs. Right. And, and I think that kind of trend is going to happen more and more. And I think China, if you want to think about, you know, what does the future of marketing look like, et cetera, et cetera. Fantastic. I think Asia, China is really well positioned to be a, a thought leader in what advertising and brand creation looks like in, in this Kind of social distancing world because that's what Chan has already been doing because of the influence of the, the power of the dominance of the mobile phone. And so, for example, I was talking to Coca-Cola, the head of Coca-Cola in China uh, last year, and Coca-Cola is a small market share in China. And he said, we, because we have a small market share in almost every country Coca-Cola is in, we're the number one, you know, biggest market share. So we can't do, we don't have freedom. In China, we have a small market share, so I can experiment. And he said, what we're doing in, in uh, China is they're actively scanning uh, 250,000 KOLs in China every day. And if you have more than 100,000 users, they, they scan you. They, they, so they're scanning 250,000 KOLs every day. And then they're doing meta-analytics on top of that about what these people are talking about. What are, the, what are the trends? What's happening? What's not happening? And then they think about how to reposition Coca-Cola and who I, you know, in terms of what KOLs are saying is trending in society. And I was like, well, that's fascinating for me. I mean, that's definitely not what Coke is doing in the U.S., right? So I think in terms of marketing and branding, wow, I think China has a fascinating opportunity to be at the forefront of what that will look like for the world, because that's what they've already been doing, right? So I think it's a fascinating opportunity. Okay, great. Thank you, Professor. Um, you did mention education, um, and we have one here about education, um, so uh, close to home. Um, obviously, at the moment, there's no choice but to take our learning online. Um, but once things return to normal post-COVID-19, do you think this uh, this change and this momentum will continue or will we return back to normal? I, 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 it, it will be a bifurcation. So for degreed programs, even for high-end executive, in person. Because for the simple reality, you know, if I'm a third-tier player, you know, I, I would rather go to, you know, Sieves or MIT online, you know, than go to, I don't know, University of South Dakota or something, right? I mean, maybe it's a great university, I don't know, but I just picked them out of the blue, right? Um, but, but, you know, because in a great institution that attracts great students, 
you learn just as much from the students as you do from the professor. And maybe not immediately, but you develop a network of people. And, and you, I, you probably know much better than I do, Marcel, but the number of business opportunities that Siebes has created just from alumni that now know each other and then go do something together and all these kind of things. It's an absolute, you know, amazing organic thing that just happens. You, you, you don't plan it, but it just happens. Where I do think the distance learning will happen is to spark curiosity. Like the odd visor thing I mentioned, these micro podcasts, right? So, because it's easy to, to, to you know, get tons of information every day, right? That's easy, but to, to summarize it down to a critical event and then an action, that becomes interesting, right? So I think, again, you'll see people consume information in different channels. Um, I think they we may, oh, here he is. Pardon me? Sorry, sorry, Professor, we lost you very briefly, but please continue. Oh, okay. I, I, hopefully I said nothing important at that time. Maybe I've said nothing important all morning, so it's probably okay. But I think for, you know, in person, you, you will continue to do it when it's about fundamental learning. And particularly when you're developing a, a new skill, because you need a network. But there are, for online, you will do for the perspective right? The, the current trends, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I, I don't see a world where, you know, particularly for undergraduate education, you know, that it's all going to be done with distance learning because, you know, you're 18 years old to 22, you know, getting out of the house and realizing laundry does not magically wash itself. You know, I mean, there's many rites of passages and social growth and other things that need to occur besides the classroom education, right? And, and so those are, those are invaluable. Right, so, so I, I think the in-person education will not disappear, but it will be, you know, it will be horses for courses. We choose different channels for different types of learning. Before there was no choice, now we will have a choice, but it will not replace. Great, um, look, we have a lot of uh, really good questions coming through. Um, I encourage you to continue to post your questions in the chat, uh, chat box. Um, next, we have a really good question here from Nick, um, who asks, to what extent does strategy have to be done traditionally by the top versus a dynamic involving those on the front line? I mean, that's a really interesting question. I, I think that increasingly the best companies that I know already, and I think this is, you know, going to be the new norm, right? If there is such a thing as the new norm, is strategy increasingly is bottom up, not top down. Right, because the idea before is, you know, the comp the people at the top have the, you know, the this, you know, overarching perspective, and they go away to the big conference room and they think, and they come out with this is our five year plan, and now you go do it. Almost every strategic innovation I've seen in the last twenty years has been bottom up, not top down. It's people on the edges of the organization, those interfacing with suppliers, with customers right, with partners, whatever, those are the ones that see the need for change or the opportunity for innovation. And the job of senior executives is not to create innovation, but it's to realize the strategic potential of ideas being generated here, and then to put their muscle, their power, their economic power, whatever, behind it and accelerate those ideas through companies as quickly as possible. So they're an accelerator of innovation. They're not a creator of innovation. So I think one of the trends that I'll see more and that I see already, and I will see it more and more, is strategy is bottom up, not top down. And the job of senior executives are to accelerate and standardize that message, right? To make it more systemic. That's the job. Okay, great. A uh, question here from Christian, who's gonna really uh, put you on the spot. Um, in the context of the impact of coronavirus, um, when do you believe that China may surpass the U.S. as the largest economy before uh, was 2030? Um, will that be sooner or, or, or later? Hey, man, if I knew that, I wouldn't tell you. It's worth too much money. Um, I, mean, I mean, who knows? You know, I mean, there's, there's, multi, there's, there's countervailing factors, right? And that's the reason we don't know. So is China going to recover from the COVID-19 more quickly than the West, Europe and the U.S.? 
if you look at current data, I would say yes, right? I mean, that's, that's the simple reality. Um, so that would say China will surpass quickly, more quickly, you know, even than 2030. The downside is, is, you know, because of all the disruption of global supply chains, et cetera, et cetera, will more companies think about moving some of their manufacturing closer to home away from China? And so that will be the limiting factor, right? Now, personally, I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think it can happen in large scale. So maybe, you know, companies will develop, you know, another channel for manufacturing that's 10, 15 percent, you know, something like that. But they can't do it cost effect. I mean, in today's world where, you know, everybody, there's not enough money. Companies don't have businesses. They're bleeding cash. I find it incredibly unlikely that companies are going to be able to do hundreds of, you know, millions, billions of dollars of capital expenditures for new factories, new whatever, new automobile plants. Come on, they're shuttering plants everywhere. So you're going to go spend, you, you think you're going to get a bank or shareholders to approve, you know, a billion dollars to build a new plant? I don't think so, right? So there's a lot of political rhetoric about doing this, but the economic I, a reality is I don't see how they're going to do it, right? And so there will be some rebalancing on the fringe, but, you know, so if I plus minus those two factors, I think it'll probably be about the same. Maybe China will accelerate maybe two or three years earlier, but not much, not much more than that, you know, from the 2030, uh, you know, expectation. I don't, I don't see it happening. Okay, great. Question here from James. Um, you mentioned video and mobile as key tech trends. Uh, how about AI and blockchain as the new game changer? Um, and uh, your forecast for which continent will lead in that? Uh, AI, I, I'll say blockchain. I think it's going to be China for sure. Uh, I, I would say they're going to be the world leader in blockchain. I mean, I, I say that just strictly from an economics. Out of all VC money invested in the world in blockchain, 49% has been invested in China. So China has, you know, half the, com you know, half the money spent is in China, right? And so if you're just a betting person, you would say it's going to be some Chinese company that's going to, been, that's most likely going to create the blockchain success formula. And again, I, I, you know, as you can tell, I'm not Chinese, obviously, I don't know. You know, I don't have deep insights into the Chinese government, but I know a few months ago, I guess last year, President Xi made a statement about how important blockchain was to the future economic growth of China. And the next day, seven companies went up, you know, that were publicly traded either on the Hong Kong or Shanghai Stock Exchange that had anything to do with blockchain, their share price went up at least 10%. Now, you know, I find China, you know, on average, the government is very smart. These guys think. So let, let's speculate. Again, I have no, no knowledge, but if I just sit back as a business strategy person and think, I'd say, okay, I have one belt, one road. I'm spending a trillion dollars putting physical infrastructure in place. Ports, railways, you name it, et cetera, et cetera. What's the likelihood that pick some time frame? that I've just built all your ports. And then I would say, I'm happy to trade with you, but would you mind if we trade in RMB, not US dollars, that the contracts are denominated in RMB, not dollars? You're only going to say yes, because they just built the port. And then you say, if, why don't we use this blockchain algorithm or this blockchain payment system, right, to pay? you know, to transfer funds, right? So I think the interesting thing that China is doing with the hard, because One Belt, One Road is a hardware investment, right? It's a physical infrastructure. What's the software going to be on top of it, right? Of this One Belt, One Road? What, what are, what's the payment mechanisms and what currency will the payment mechanisms be? And I'm sure the Chinese government is thinking, has already thought about those kind of things, right? I mean, these guys are, you know, it, you, this is something that I think may accelerate China's growth. AI, it's not so clear to me. 
right? I mean, I think China is very well positioned there, but there's a lot of AI software happening in US, Israel, and India, right? And the problem with AI is it's, with blockchain, it's gonna be winner take all, right? There's gonna be one or two big blockchain platforms that dominate, right? Because that, that's the way those kind of things work. And China, particularly if they couple it with a one belt, one road, they will get the dominant market share. They'll get the, you know, to accelerate and become the standard. With AI, uh, as it implies, the, 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 the domain knowledge is much more specific. Therefore, you're not going to see winner take all things. AI will be much more fragmented. So you have to go ask, you have to ask where the domain knowledge is for the different things that will happen in AI. So AI will be more fragmented while blockchain will be one or two killer apps. Yeah. Now that said, <coughs> who has the most data? Because AI requires data. Right? Why, why is AI, AI has been being discussed for 50 years, but why is it getting crazy now? Because the amount of data and the cost of accumulating that data and the speed of accumulating that data is unprecedented. Who has the most data in the world? China and the US. So it's, it's gonna be those guys, I would predict. Yeah, in China, you would argue probably has more data than the US in certain areas in certain spaces, right? Particularly mobile data. They, they had definitely have more. Yeah. So, but, but AI, besides domain expertise, you need data. That's how you win because the algorithms learn more quickly. Data, data, data. Great. Thank you. Um, I have a question here from SW, which question that makes me very happy. It says, hi, professor. I work in the sports and entertainment industry, which has been hit most severely <laughs> by the pandemic as all the big stadiums and arenas i'm running have been closed like uh disneyland you mentioned in your speech yep. do you have any tips on how to adjust our strategies and uh he or she says by the way i've received the admission letter for 2020 gemba class so uh, you'll probably be crossing paths uh with them quite soon i guess i think that's the best thing you can do Re retool I mean, the, the, simple, the simple reality is, you know, this is not an industry that's going to bounce back in the short term. You know, I, I think long term, of course, we're social animals. I mean, we like to do these kind of things. I mean, sports are a, you know, are a part of, you know, a, a nation's, a city's identity. So, you know, I don't think people want to be, you know, doing everything inside their home, you know, et cetera, et cetera. We are inherently social animals, right? But... I, I, you know, I, I don't know how, I don't know how we solve that in the short to medium term. I think, you know, if I look at the COVID-19 thing, I think there's three major variables, forces that are, that are intertwined here. One is obviously the health, right, of solving the problem around health. Second is economics, right, in terms of, you know, the, the debate that the U.S. is going through right now. You know, is, is, do I open up the economy sooner to get that moving at the risk of, you know, health, you know, how do I balance those two? Not simple, right? And we see Europe going through the same thing as Spain starts to open up while France says, well, I'm going to stay closed, you know, another month. And then the third factor that doesn't get as much discussion, but I think increasingly will longer term is privacy, right? And the, the, the willingness to share information, right? Because you have all these amazing tracking algorithms over mobile phones, you know, that are clearly being used in China, they're used in South Korea, in Taiwan, you know, and in the US, you know, people, you know, so each country may have different views on how to intertwine those three variables. The intertwining of those three variables will directly affect the ability, how quickly the social sports arena stuff opens up, you know. So I, I, you know, I would, you know, I think your industry has to take a deep hit now and solve all these problems because otherwise people will not, not go out again, right? It, it's just, it's not worth the risk. I mean, you think about a huge sports stadium in the U.S. I don't know what the biggest ones are in, in China, uh, but in the U.S., a University of Michigan football stadium is 105,000 people. So 105,000 people in a tight space. If you look at the, the mortality rate, that means 5,000 people could die, 
how many people are going to go see a sporting match if you have a 5% of dying from attending the event, right? So we have to have confidence. You know, I think there's going to be more testing as you, before you can enter, you know, uh, just like after 9-11. I saw Emirates, I think later this week or next week is testing a flight. They're going to fly uh, a flight somewhere. Every passenger before they get on the airplane will be COVID-19 tested. Right, because what's the, what's the biggest barrier for air travel? Not only that, you know, people don't, you know, if, if company, countries don't want you to land there, if they think you're you're bringing sick people in, right? And we see, you know, most of the COVID nineteen cases in China are from people coming in, not within China. But the second factor is, if I'm flying on the airplane, I want to make sure that nobody around me is sick, right? So you have to create confidence. So you know, our sports venues, arenas, are they going to have to do? rapid COVID-19 testing or have amazing algorithms that do all the tracing and they basically can guarantee safety, right? Just like you had bouncers in a nightclub that say, we're going to make sure no drunk beats you up. Or are we going to have to make sure that sick people don't get in in the first place? Is that going to be another cost of providing this, you know, health security? in these kind of venues. And I think that's the simple reality. Just like flying, uh, you know, after 9-11, you will have to provide different things to make your customer feel comfortable. And health security will be paramount to those industries relaunching. And I think you may have to be the innovator of that before the government. And I think, again, governments will then look to these kind of industries as establishing leading edge practices. Okay, great, thank you. Um, a question here from Diana. Um, do you see sustainability issues becoming increasingly important in strategic planning? Companies prioritizing environmental, social, ethical issues as heavily as financial profits? Uh, Long-term, yes, short-term, no. I mean, I, I would like that to be short-term, yes, but I think the simple reality is so many companies are now faced with survival. Right. And, and if it's life and death, you worry about living first and about polluting second. I mean, that's the simple reality. Right. So, you know, in a crisis, it's, you know, it's life and death. You know, it's it's the cut off my arm to save the body. Right. And I think that's where, you know, in particularly certain industries, many companies are. So they're going to be much more worried about life. Once I know I'm alive, then I'll worry about the environment in which I can live. But I think in the short term, in the next two or three years, companies are going to worry much more about simple financial survival. Right or wrong, but I think that's, that's reality. Okay, great. Um, you shared an example. This is a question from Carl. Thank you. Um, you shared an example uh, of a company needing or having monthly strategy change. I'm wondering how they make sure the resource and employees are aligned with that strategy. I mean, it's, 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 they, they, it's largely through incentives, right? I mean, so, so it's the classic measure drives out unmeasured performance, right? So they have, you know, so, so once they understand what they want, then they, they start to, to change the incentive, the bonus structure, et cetera, to, to make sure that those kind of new priorities happen, right? So very effective in terms of dealer incentives, getting feedback from the dealer on what, people are asking for in a car, et cetera. They, they never hear about those things, but they give incentives for the dealer to convey that information back to headquarters. Zara does the same thing uh, in the fast fashion. Uh, a Zara manager, something like over 60% uh, of their bonus for the year is determined by uh, a phone call that the manager has to make one time per week back to headquarters. And what's the subject of that weekly phone call? Emerging fashion trends. What do you see people, uh, you know, asking for? What colors are people combining, you know, when they try on clothes? What clothes are people bringing in from another store to try on with our clothes, right? Because in fast fashion, it's all about picking up new trends, right? And so Zara, the number one uh, factor of a store manager's bonus is telling them about emerging fashion trends. So it's alignment between information you need and incentives. That's the simple thing. I would start there. That, that will get you 80% of the way there. 
Okay, fantastic. Um, a question from Harish. Uh, how does how do evergreen industries like steel and copper fit into this internet world? Um, I mean, there's always a demand for these things, right? So increasingly, I think, you know, I mean, you know better than I do, increasingly what's happening is, you know, the power of online auctions uh, in terms of influencing price, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And the biggest trends, at least that I see in certain parts of the world is, you know, many small uh, buyers of these products are bundling together, you know, their orders to be able to negotiate better prices, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, you know, increasingly what these companies will have to do, and I think already is happening, is they're getting out of the commodity business and they're looking at producing the more specialized products and they, you know, in smaller production runs, et cetera, et cetera, in some cases, <coughs> and by providing that additional service and, you know, more uh, tightly, you know, specified product, they can charge a premium, right? And so increasingly that's going to require the ability to interact with your customers digitally in a much more responsive, quick time frame, right? So, you know, and so increasingly most of the, you know, the oil, particularly oil for sure already, you know, I was in uh, at Reliance, some of their factories in India in terms of petroleum, but, the, you know, it's totally, you know, cab cam and depending on the kind of oil product that has to be manufactured, they can tweak all the, the production variables and they can make like 700 different types of oil products out of one factory, all because they computer control the inputs, right? So I think increasingly that kind of computer controlled manufacturing, even for commodity like products, oil, steel, et cetera, that's gonna become absolutely the new norm because it lets you be more responsive. So the same trend. So it's even happening in these kind of basic industries. Okay, thank you uh, very much, Professor. I think we've, we've just about run out of time. Um, so uh, we are gonna have to stop on the questions there. What we're gonna try and do is, um, we've got a record here of the, of the chat. And so we're gonna try and, uh, if we can, uh, identify those questions that haven't yet been addressed and try and get an answer back to those, to those people. Um, thank you uh, very much to our audience. I mean, very active on the pop quiz, very active on the questions uh, there too. So it's great to see uh, such an active audience. Um, thank you very much, Professor, for, for your time. Um, very much uh, appreciated um, uh, from us and from, from the audience, I'm sure. Um, I am going to uh, just now, um, to our audience, um, introduce uh, a couple of events that we have coming up um, that we would uh, warmly welcome any of you to, to join us for. So next week, next Tuesday, April 28th, we have uh, uh, another webinar, which will be led by a professor again. This time it's Professor Jack Wood, who is uh, a, a fantastic leadership professor at SEEDS. Um, he's gonna be talking again about leadership in disruptive times, real world, real leadership. Um, professor Wood will be joined by two uh, executives who are um, current and past students of our program, the Global EMBA. Um, so if you are interested in that event, um, please uh, scan, the, you can scan the QR code on the, uh, the bottom left there and you go to the page to, to then register for that event. Warm, all are welcome. Um, so please join that next, uh, next Tuesday, 7 p.m. And on the right hand side uh, is an event on May the 12th. This will be uh, an info session. So it will be talking specifically about our global EMBA program. Um, and we have four fantastic uh, alumni from, from the program. You can see there from some sort of finance to an entrepreneur, we have uh, industrial man uh, manufacturing as well as uh, FMCG. Um, so uh, some really interesting insights um, from, from them. They'll share a bit about their experience, what it was like for them at SEEBS with the uh, executive MBA program um, and, and some sort of tips for people who are maybe thinking about that for their future. So that is on May the 12th um, at uh, 7 p.m. again, so that'll be evening time, so we can also catch our European uh, audience as well. So that's on the bottom right, if you want to um, register uh, to come along, to join that webinar then, both of these are, of course, webinars um, at this time. So I wanted to say thank you once again to the professor, Professor Jeffrey Sampler, um, thanks for, for giving your time and answering the, all the questions we had. 
Um, thank you very much to all of our attendees. Um, it's been really a real pleasure uh, having you here um, and your, your input's um, been really, uh, really great for us too. Thanks, of course, to AmCham Shanghai. Um, always um, a delight working with you guys. Um, thank you very much. If uh, any of you do wish to learn a bit more um, about the SEEBS Global Executive MBA program, um, those are my details there on the right-hand side. That's my name, uh, Marcel. I'm very happy if you want to email me for more information. Um, our website's there in the middle. Um, and on the left-hand side, um, encourage you to follow our WeChat account. Um, but that's it from us today. Um, so thank you again very much for joining um, and wish everyone a safe and healthy uh, time uh, through this, uh, these challenging times. Thank you very much.